So today, we're going to be talking all about group work, uh, especially a number of common problems that you might face within group work. Um, so with so what we're going to be discussing, first of all, is what is group work? Why do you actually have to do group work at university? And then some of the common pitfalls and ways that you can, mistakes that people do make when doing group work. Also, that you can understand what, what mistakes people make and how you can avoid them yourself. So today we're joined by myself. I'm going to be talking from my perspective as a student and also the research I've done for group work when making the group with skills guides. And we've got Tim, who's a, who is a who has lots of experience running group work assessments. You were going to say legend, weren't you? I like legend. I am a legend, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. Anyway, Alex, you've, you've told us what we're, uh, what we're talking about, so that's good. Um, where do you want to start today? What is the, so, the main thing you want to talk about? So, so the first thing that we're going to do, though, Tim, is we're going to talk all about group work. So, Tim, what is group work and why do we actually do group work? Yeah, so group work is, uh, it can be many things. Let's start off straight away with saying the group work can be two people working together on a project. It can be uh, 15 people working together on a technical uh, challenge, whatever it is. So group work basically is just people working together to achieve an outcome that they want to achieve. Um, and I think the the more relevant question is why do we have group work in our academic uh, profile, in our academic work, if you like? Um, and that's mainly because once you stop being a student, and even before, you know, I always find that a weird argument, actually. I will elaborate on that. Um, but when you get into a workplace, you'll be expected to work with people. You know, me, Alex, and Naomi work together almost every day on an enormous amount of stuff. Um, and understanding how that dynamic works is really important. Understanding how to uh, behave and operate in a group is really important. So it makes sense as one of the key skills at university that you get out of your university degree, having that ability to operate in a group is really important. Um, And like I said, you always hear, oh, well, you'll have to use it in the workplace. If you haven't worked in a group before you came to university, then I would like to know uh, what's going on in your life. Because if you've not worked, you know, uh, on the sports pitch or whatever it is, you know, you've been working in a group anyway, even in a family context, whatever you want to uh, describe it as. So group work is one of those things that's very natural to us, um, but doesn't always come naturally. And in particular, the challenge for university is assessed group work, I think. Have you got any experience with assessed group work, Alex? Yeah, so I was involved in a number of group projects. Some went really, really well. And some others actually had a few difficulties that we'll allude to later on how we got over those. Um, But one thing that I really found that group work was useful for is helping you make friends with people outside of your individual circle. So it was really good for making contacts, meeting new people and also to build, start building relationships or learning to build relationships in a professional environment with people you might not know. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why group work is often included in the first and second years is because you'll be working with people, you'll be learning to make new friends and connections who can help you throughout your degree. Yeah, it's it's just one of those key skills, isn't it? You know, there's no way around it. Um, and even if you were to go for a career where you think that you can do everything on your own, even then, you know, the skills that you learn in operating in a group are really important. It's all about communicating about understanding the context and the challenges of other people around you. So it's just something that you need to get on with and that you need to do. So have we got... I'm not sure I understand. Oh, wow, Siri, that was good. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Siri. Hopefully we can help you understand throughout the rest of the work. I know. Um, oh, dear. I thought I'd switch uh, everything off. That's only the second thing to have gone wrong today, so we'll leave it at that. Um so what are we going to uh, do, Alex? Are we going to try and give some advice about all of this? Yes. So, Tim, would you like to start off by saying a piece of advice that you give to people who are doing group work? Yeah, so one of the key things, I think, is to have accountability built into your group work. So make sure that you can explain uh, who's been doing what and uh, wh- how you got to those decisions as well. So... Um, yeah, I'll, I'm sure I'll get to talk about that a bit more, but having that accountability is really important, I think. Well, yeah, I totally agree. Um, having, working out who's doing what and knowing what an overall plan is, I think is vital. I was going to say, but my first piece of advice for group work is, from the very start of group work, is actually try and get to know the group that you're working with. Don't just 
try and start doing work, at least try to get to know what pe- who people are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and what really they're good at. Because then you could help pair people up in a task that benefit their, that that work well with their skill set. Yeah. So uh, I always like uh, bringing up this example. When I was doing a master's in uh, Sheffield, uh, way too long ago now. Oh, dear, that really is long ago. Um, but I worked with uh, in a group. It was a very big international uh, population, if you like. And the group that I was in that I will never forget, uh, I worked together with two Chinese students, um, a lady and a gentleman. And the lady was really dedicated, very good at detail, really precise worker, got everything done in no time. And a gentleman sort of disappeared most of the day and we never quite understood what was going on. Um, until I actually realized that what was happening was that he stayed up at night so that he could talk to his friends over in China, play games with them online, stuff like that. So his daytime was actually his nighttime. And once I realized that, we could then start planning meetings differently and actually make it more appropriate for him to be part of that group as well. So, yeah, getting to know goes beyond knowing the name. It, it's also understanding people's patterns and, and what they like doing and not like doing. Yeah, it can really help you to work well together as well. So yeah. I always had a first meeting and we would, for most of it, just not even talk about the work. We'd just introduce ourselves, talk about what we know and really get to know how we worked and what and we were formulating a plan. So with every group I've worked in, We've never followed the same formula of this is exactly how we will work every single time. Yeah. There's always been a bit of a, we take into account individual circumstances and how individuals want to work best, and we adapt every time. We've got a question, Alex, that I'm just wanting to address real quick. Naomi's already uh, talking about it as well. Uh, but Leon has asked, uh, if I have a group journal online, is this where I would put my updates? Yes, absolutely. And it's a really good idea to have somewhere uh, a shared resource that you can use to um, store, you know, what you've been doing, who's been doing it. So that's really great. Um, and actually, you know, as a university, we offer all the tools for that, don't we? So we've got our Teams and uh, OneNote and all those different tools that you can use for that. So absolutely do use yeah. that. Have you got another top tip, Alex? Yeah, so just speaking about that, there's actually quite a lot of online tools that you can use for group work. So Tim just mentioned Teams. You can set up a team within Teams to share files, to chat. There's also, um, if you don't want to share files in Teams, there's also, I use Dropbox and things like that to share files. Um, But Teams is also really good for having meetings. Um, There are also apps out there such as Todo, which you can access through you do so when you do there's a microsoft office 365 tile and you can access that called to do which is really really good for uh planning individual actions and you can then assign them to people and share them as a group which i think is really good there's actually a tool alex that's called planner uh, and we don't use yeah. it on a day-to-day basis but for group work that's really good and you can actually set targets for different people in that uh, it's meant to help with streamlining that uh, group work yeah. process if you like yeah and there's a few apps out there that are like notice boards. What was the app that we used, Tim, uh, within our teams that we had like um, Padlet. different... Padlet. Yeah, so Padlet. we used Padlet to post sticky notes and almost had like progress lists of uh, who, what the tasks are and who's doing what. And that was really good to get your head around the overall big picture. Yeah. Something else that is really important that uh, people underestimate, I think, is having regular meetings. Uh, So again, we have a weekly skills meeting where we bring together everybody who's involved with the work that we do. Um, And having that regular touch point is really important because it means that you can discuss not just the work that you've done, but the work that you are about to do. And you can see what other people are at and you can support each other in achieving things. So that's really important. And that again, these online tools really help in uh, facilitating that. So in Teams, for example, it's really easy to set up a quick meeting, find out when people are available, and you know just get on with it. Um, and that's definitely something that will benefit you as a group if you have very regular touch points. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, having a regular meeting that everyone can attend and almost setting them up with time and uh, setting them up with notice means that everyone can attend them. And if people can let you know if they can't attend, they can send submissions or what they've done in advance in written format and so on. And that can really help with uh, making sure work ticks along, but also checking progress. Because um, I think it is really important to meet as a whole group. And if you are splitting tasks into subgroups, meeting is subgroups. Uh, but having regular meetings, one every week or two, that can be really useful. Yeah, absolutely. 
And how about planning the work uh, that you want to do? So something that I would recommend is to actually try and use backwards planning to plan out the entire group work assessment and work out what needs to be done and try and work out a timeline. So I'd recommend create a timeline for your group and make your meetings revolve around that timeline or make the timeline work around the meetings you've got planned. And that way you can try and set yourself deadlines because if you just say, okay, we want the whole thing done by, I don't know, the 31st, 31st is bad. 31st of December, let's say we want it done by the 31st of December. Um, well, if you don't set yourself interim deadlines within your group, you can end up just missing progress or not, or end up rushing. So setting yourself small deadlines via the timescale, that can really help you to make sure everything's ticking along and bits and pieces get done and reflected on and properly worked on. Yeah. And not only that, you're going to talk a bit later about uh, doing presentations as a group. Yes. Um, and part of that planning as well is make sure that you're all uh, understand the bigger picture as well you know mm. having that bigger picture is really important because you're working towards a joint outcome so that yeah. big picture needs to be kept track of and ca- keep being reiterated yeah and one thing that i would always recommend about that big picture is understand the big picture what everyone's doing is good because you can actually give feedback to individuals who are working on different areas because it's group work essentially you won't just working individually on one task that's then being split up so each person's doing different parts yeah the one person might be leading on that task but it doesn't mean that they in the meetings they can present what they've done and you can give them some feedback and if you understand what they're doing you can actually give them proper feedback and act on it otherwise it's just their work mm. not the group's work so that's what meetings can be useful for is assessing what work's being done and giving feedback and reflections and pointers yeah um, I'm not sure, um, I'm just going through our notes, I don't think we'll actually touch on this uh, explicitly, but one of the things that um, I think is important to understand in a group, and uh, particularly with the size of the group as well, is um, who's in charge, right? So uh, the having a chairperson, for example, in a project group seems like a good idea, but actually that can be a, a point of information as well, right? So if you have a chairperson then it's sort of assumed that that person is going to take care of everything and the rest of the group can just sort of dangle along and, mm-hmm. you know, hope that they don't get too much work assigned. So in terms of um, group management, if you like, Alex, what, what sort of things would you do to try and make sure that you get everything online, that that planning actually happens? So, um, as, a ch- so as a chairperson, that doesn't actually necessarily mean that you do all the work, um, for sure, 100%. Uh, I am chairperson of a organization to be quite honest i do about the same amount as everyone else who's in that organization and all that being a chairperson means is you're the one who in a meeting asks the questions you're the one who helps to make things flow and make sure everyone's getting involved and has their chance to have their say and you're almost just keeping people the time yeah so that's all a chairperson does it doesn't mean you do more work no and that one way that i think that timekeeping is actually really important. So a chairperson's role more is more about facilitating the discussion mm. than leading the discussion, and people don't always understand that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that really helps, and sorry, I'm just interrupting you rudely here, the other thing that really helps is actually have everybody in the team um, understand their responsibility and give them everybody a reasonable job as well. So it's not yeah, just exactly a chairperson. You can get, um, you know, you can have a, a secretary, someone who keeps track of all the notes and minutes and all the planning documents, stuff like that. You can have someone who's best at uh, the graphical side of things. You can have someone who's a good writer, for example, who could put the report together. So again, we're going back to that, what we talked about in the beginning is understanding your group and knowing who's in the group uh, and actually taking some time to talk to each other about, you know, what are you good at? What would you like doing? Uh, how can we make the most of the skill set that you have is really important. Yeah. I, t- I totally agree with what you just said, Tim. I think um, one of the ways to get everyone to actually do something is by giving everyone a clear and defined task yeah. and by asking them to present their task in a meeting. And don't always expect everyone to have done everything for that meeting. And if someone hasn't done the work, don't just shout at them. Try and help see what you can do to support them with that work because yeah. um, some people might not be able to get as much done for a particular meeting as others. But um yeah do make sure they've got a specific area and try and guide them along the area. Yeah. Because if you give them something to do rather than just something g- generic, that can really help them. Yeah. So Leon's asked another question, and we are actually going to touch on this in a, in a second. Um, 
But when you reach a wall after eating out multiple times, at what point do you actually raise this as a concern with regards to communication? So we've actually thought about how we're going to put this session together. We're, I think we're ready to talk about that now, Alex, aren't we? Um, yeah, pretty much. I think we've covered everything, all the main piece of advice that we've got. We have got some advice also uh, on our skills guide that we'll show you later. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so now we're going to talk about uh, what you do when some difficulties do come along within group work. Mm-hmm. Um, so referring to what Leon said, Tim, what advice would you give when you've reached a wall after reaching out to someone multiple times who might not have done the work. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Um, there's several things that you can do, right? The first thing I want to point out is that your the reason that you've been asked to do group work isn't to make your life difficult. Um, and we've talked about this before with um, exam questions and stuff like that. Your lecturer does not actually benefit from you failing as a group, right? There is no benefit whatsoever in that going wrong. So... A coaching meeting with your lecturer, with whoever is giving the module, uh, might be a really good intervention. If you feel it is really going wrong, it's worth actually talking to your lecturer and actually signaling early on that there might be a problem. But don't expect the lecturer to come in and go, okay, I'm going to do this, 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 and then the problem's away. All that the lecturer will do uh, in most cases is actually say, okay, well, how are you going to resolve this? What are you wanting to do to actually make this problem go away? Um, and it's, again, in the lecturer's benefit that you as a group manage to resolve that issue. So I manage uh, a number of people in, in real life, you know, as a, as a manager in the library, um, and I don't gain anything from having people say they don't like each other because what am I going to do about it, right? If you feel like you're not getting on with someone because they've not done the work, then you need to find a way to resolve that, and that's actually that bit of learning that's intri- intrinsic in uh, working as a team. What I will say is that the key to stopping that becoming a problem is keeping track, like we said before, of everything that you do, plan the work really extensively, make sure that everybody understands what their role is, and make sure that everybody's on board as well. Give everybody a substantial piece of work rather than trying to pack them. You know, the worst examples I've seen... Um, I'm just digging back to my time when I worked over at Loughborough. I had a group there that um, before they even got together, it was a group of five people, if I recall well, and four of them knew each other really well, and they decided straight away that the fifth person was not necessary, and they didn't interact with this person. And I got this person actually coming to me and go, look, I've got a major issue because I want to contribute, but I'm not being asked to do anything. And that's actually really frustrating, isn't it? So... Make sure that you understand that as a group, you have the responsibility to come to the end product. And it's not about appointing one or two people who are clever and know everything to do it, because that's not what the lecturer is looking for. The lecturer is looking for that evidence of group work, so make sure you do that. Um, I've got an example as well from when I was a student. So my first year, there was a student in, oh, there's actually two students within one of my groups, and they just disappeared like um, to be quite honest with you like they wouldn't respond to our messages they wouldn't even open them and we're trying to think about what we could do to try and get in contact with them so uh, in the end what after multiple failed attempts to get in contact with them we spoke to the lecturer the lecturer sent them an email and um, we then managed to get in touch with them and we just tried to arrange everything as much as we could around him or give him options it turns out he was struggling with lots of things at the time and as soon as we found out that and he realised that we were not trying to get on his back for not doing the work, but help him and support him with that work, he actually helped a lot. I don't think that can always happen. I don't think that's always going to be the resolution, but try to think about as many creative options as you can to try and get in touch with that person is what I would recommend having really that experience because often people do want to help. They aren't just at university not to do anything, but as long as they realise that they're not being punished for not doing the work or that you just want to help them with it, that might help. And especially as soon as you start understanding why they aren't doing the work rather than just they aren't doing the work, that can yeah. really help with you with creating that's, solutions. That's a really important point, Alex, actually. And I think, again, I speak from my experience as a manager. If I have someone who doesn't want to do a certain task uh, who works for me, the wrong approach is to go to them and say, look, if you don't do it, I'm going to get really pissed off with you, right? Because that doesn't actually generate any relationship skills or anything like, you know, there's no positive capital to be had in that. 
the right thing to do is to actually go to that person and say, what do I need to do to make sure that you can actually achieve what I'm asking you to do? Um, and that's a very different approach. So that's actually one of the things, Alex, and I'm, I'm pleased you raised that. You see that go wrong in groups a lot, where one or two people feel that they've been put on the spot, where they feel they are doing more than everybody else. And because of that, they get angry with everybody else. And that anger is really unproductive, right? Um, and although I understand that you are feeling angry because you are doing more work, that's not the right uh, answer. That's not the solution to actually get out of that situation. So understanding that human dimension is really important, you know. Uh, you might be working with someone who's actually doing another module that's actually really demanding uh, that you're not doing at that point, point in time. So be aware of that and talk to each other and keep that communication going is really, really important. So, Tim, we've just had a really good question from Zoe in the chat saying, what advice would you have for UDL students? Who we only really have the email addresses of other students who are often dotted around the world when they don't reply. So mm. when they don't reply, what can we do? The joy of remote working, isn't it? Um, mm. I've recently, uh, and again, it's it's useful to draw on my own experiences. So I was a part of, I still am a part of uh, a conference committee. So we're uh, setting up a program for a conference and it's for the international... Uh, I'm trying to not butcher the name now. It's the Asian Library Digital Library Conference, ACDL. A ACDL? Anyway, um, it's an Asian conference. So let's say we've got people from India, China, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and then there's a bunch of Brits and Americans because we're always getting involved with everything. So having those meetings is <laughs> it's interesting right because uh, my best mate for example is a professor in Wuhan which is how I got onto that committee and his time difference is such that if he rings me at four o'clock in the afternoon which for me is usually when I start having time available in the day he's actually you know one o'clock at night so bearing that in mind is really important and actually that time difference with UDL students in particular uh, can be really tricky to manage so what you need to do then is think about how you can facilitate that communication in a suitable way where everybody can contribute. And with you, Dol, again, the challenge is that people have their own lives next to the study that they're doing. So if you've got someone in the United Arab Emirates, you've got someone in London, you've got someone in San Francisco, it will be really difficult to find that time to actually talk to each other. But you will have to make that effort uh, because speaking in person, even if it's through a camera on a computer, is always beneficial. So do try and find those opportunities to communicate. Um, if you're not getting any response whatsoever, then you will have to talk to your uh, lecturer and make clear that you have reached out. And the way to do that, be quite persistent, send an email, you know, send two, three different emails over a period of time, try and get hold of this person. And then the fourth email can be uh, one where you CC and the lecturer actually asking the lecturer to check the email address because you're not sure you've got the right one. So you're actually notifying in a very friendly way the lecturer of the fact that you've not had a reply for several uh, attempts. What do they want you to do about it? And then you can have a conversation with your lecturer to see if you can find a solution to it. I totally agree with that advice, Tim. Uh, I think that would be something that I would do if no one was talking to me. Um, another thing that you can do potentially as well is... Um, when you first meet people, try and get their contact details more than just the email because some students don't check their email very often. Mm. So I would always say to people, what's your preferred method of communication and try and work out a way that works for everyone. So in the past, I've had Facebook groups, I've had WhatsApp groups. Now we've got Teams. That could be a way, but if some people don't have access to Teams all the time, is there a better way of doing, of communicating just in general? So yeah. agree a method of communication, but also don't be afraid of having people in different uh, having people's contact details in different ways so that you can get through to them. Yeah, and also keep in mind that uh, certain tools are not available in certain countries. So again, if you're working internationally, um, um, my friend in Wuhan, I can't talk to him through Teams because Teams is not actually is it's not available with international connections because of the uh, restrictions they have on internet use. So instead, we use FaceTime because he has an iPhone, I've got an iPhone, and that does work. Uh, but being creative with finding solutions to communicate to each other is really important. Email is sort of a baseline. Everybody has access to email. Um, so use that to try and discuss what way you could actually communicate to each other. Yeah. Have we got anything else? Um, yeah. So 
there's two more areas that uh, with problems that you could have within a group work and one of them is a problem which people don't always notice happening or realize is even a problem and that's what happens when you've got a student who dominates the group work um so i'm just gonna uh, say that just the person who speaks the most in a, in a group is not always the person who has the right ideas or is the most intelligent there's not a direct correlation there they might be that might be true but just because someone's dominating the group and is always talking doesn't actually mean that they are the one with the best ideas because the best ideas come from the whole group. So, Tim, what do you recommend doing if someone is overly dominating a group? Yeah, so that's always a tricky situation, isn't it? Um, being Use your human skills, right? That's step one. So you've got to be very humane in the way that you deal with something like that. Um, and actually saying to someone to the face that they are wrong is probably going to provoke a, a negative reaction. You get people, you know, putting up their collar and go, oh, I'm not wrong, and blah, blah, blah. That doesn't really help at all. So, again, having a, a good dialogue about things uh, and make sure as a group you agree on how you want to go forward is really important. So let's say that you've got a group of seven people and one person has come up with a wonderful idea and they happen to have three friends in that group, but the idea is wrong according to the three other people still in that group. Have a dialogue, right? Talk about it. Explain why you feel that there is a problem with the proposal that has been put out. Um, and don't make it emotional, right? It's not an emotive subject. Um, if you're working together in a paid career, Having that emotion cloud everything doesn't help at all. So try and keep that emotion out of it. Be rational, mm -hmm. be pragmatic, and just explain it in the way that, you know, it makes sense. So if there is an obvious problem with someone's argument, then it should also be really easy and obvious to explain what the problem is. So stay human, stay rational, stay pragmatic, I would say, with that. Yeah, I agree with those as well, Tim. Uh, something which I which we talked about earlier that could help with people who dominate is a chair role. And this can also help with something else, which are for students who do attend but don't actually say much because they're quite shy. And having a chair role can really help facilitate discussion. That means that people who talk too much, because sometimes there's be time for how long they can contribute, sometimes uh, they can help move along or invite other people to comment. Um, also, another thing that they, you can do is plan out, like, an agenda for a meeting and say okay here's what we're going to talk about and if you've got rough time scales for that that can help you with coming up with okay this per this person's going to present here so that means everyone has a chance to actually present what they're doing and talk and um, if you have got someone who is shy and doesn't want to talk something that you can do is help facilitate them by inviting them to talk and really not be mean to them when they do talk but try to encourage them to talk and like nod your head and things like that is there anything else you'd add tim for people who are yeah. shy so um you know that i do this in meetings anyway i always go around i make mm -hmm. what i call a circle you know I, I ask people what they uh what they want to contribute to the meeting i think that's really important i think it touches on something that leon has just asked as well uh, could you agree on the rule to reply within two working days Having those rules is really important. So what a good chairperson, if you have got a chairperson, what a good chairperson does is actually facilitate everybody to be able to contribute. So um, you, again, it's that human factor, isn't it? You need to be aware that someone's really quiet and then you need to encourage them to actually contribute to the conversation. Um, so the way to do that is, you know, Alex, have you got anything to say about that? Or mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? And it's really important also to realize, um, and it, this is something that I've only learned in the last few years, but some people need time to process what's going on. Um, so we've got uh, Naomi in the chat, and Naomi actually literally tells me, Tim, I need to think about this. You know, when I'm pushy for an answer or something else, Naomi will actually tell me and say, look, let me just go away for a day and I will reply to you tomorrow because I need to process what we've just gone through. And that's absolutely fine. That's actually brilliant. So if you're that quiet person, make sure that you understand that you are a quiet person in that group. But also make sure that you still contribute as well, because again, it's about that shared effort, that, that group effort. So you do, you have a responsibility, even if you don't like talking in that group, to still contribute. So do pick that up. I think that's really important. 
So yeah, I, I agree with that, Tim. Uh, that is all that we've got time for in terms of difficulties with group work. Um, but we have got a video on our YouTube channel about dealing difficulties in group work. Um, and we also have a, a video about tips for doing group work as well. So I will um, so check them out on the YouTube channel by just searching group work on the channel, uh, as well as Darby and Library, and they should come up. Um, Naomi, would you be able to put them in the chat uh, at all? Oh, we're assuming Naomi's still there. She might have gone for yes, lunch. Yes, if now. Naomi's still here, can you put them in the chat? If not, then just search it on YouTube after the session. Um, so now that we've done with that, that was our advice for group work. But we have asked students via a workshop that we ran yesterday um, how what advice they would have for group work. So we've got five pieces of advice that I'm just going to read out now. And Tim, I'm going to invite you to comment on them after I've said each one. So Ooh. the first piece of advice that was given was to create some ground rules between the group members and to define the roles and responsibilities. So what do you think about that? Absolutely, yeah. Before you even uh, step into the group work, make sure that you understand the ground rules and have agreed the ground rules. So again, like Leon says, um, if you agree that you reply to an email in two days, then make clear that that is what you do. Mm -hmm. um, also, really key, I think, in any group work, especially at university, is explaining what you expect from everybody. That's a rule in itself, you know. So, yeah, the rules are really important. And agree them really early on as well. Mm -hmm. I totally agree as well. I thought you'd agree with that one. Uh, so the second piece of advice is to understand that just because people approach things in different ways doesn't mean that it's wrong. So try and have some understanding and patience. Yeah, so we've just talked about that, haven't we? Um, mm. Certain people will need some more time to process things. Certain people will be more uh, on the front foot. Um, it actually reminds me of something that you might be able to find out on the um, uh, on the internet if you Google this. I will type it in uh, later as well. There's something called the Belbin, is it Belbin? Belbin group roles, where you can do a sort of personality test. What type of group person are you? Um, and that's really interesting. And it's not about Belbin. It's about having that understanding that there's different people and different dynamics. Um, and that, you know, the best groups actually consist of different types of people. So I'm really blessed having Naomi and Alexander because they complement what I bring to the table. Um, and that means that we operate really well as a team. So being aware of each other's strengths is really important, yeah. Yeah, 100%. You don't just want to have people who all agree with the same process. You want to have people who challenge and ask yes different things. I think yeah. that's really useful. Yeah. So the third piece of advice given by a student called Barbara said... I think the key to successful group work is to really participate. Even if you are shy and you don't feel comfortable talking to other students, you might not know it, if that is the case. It can be hard, but please try to leave your comfort zone and express your thoughts and ideas, as this may be very, very, very beneficial to the group. So this is the interesting debate about... Um... What is your responsibility as a student whilst you are conducting your studies? Um, and I don't want to go into this because it's a really interesting debate. But actually, yes, I would agree with that to the extent that challenging yourself should be part of doing a study, right? So um, if you know that you're uncomfortable in a group situation, challenge yourself. Become more comfortable. Uh, reflect on it. You know, we've talked about reflective writing and reflective working. Try and get better at the things that you feel you're weak at is actually really important in your journey as a student. And those skills that you pick up by challenging yourself are definitely going to be worth it at the end of it. I agree with that, Tim. Uh, if you just did what you're good at, you become very, very sharp in one area, but you have key weaknesses. Whereas if you yeah. try to become more rounded, you may end up finding that you end up, you may end up finding later in life that you needed that roundness or that skill that yeah. you've developed without thinking about it. The fourth piece of advice is to start as early as possible. So it's a very short one. Yeah, yes, <laughs> 100%, you know. Um, yeah. Especially with group work, you know there's going to be kinks in the cable later on. Work together as soon as possible. Get to know each other as soon as possible. Please do not leave everything to the last week because, you know, uh, in my experience, whenever you come across a really poor piece of group work, it's usually a case of, oh, we only started three days ago. Mm -hmm. That's your own bloody yeah. fault. You know, uh, if that's the case, then you deserve the grade that you get. Go away and try better next time, essentially. Yep. I uh, That makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, the earlier that you do start, the better. And 
if we're on like a normal assignment, you can't just do it the night before because you'd have to have everyone working out the night before. And some people might not be able to do that. So do start as early as possible because then that means you can arrange times that would work for everyone. Otherwise, some people might have to be left al- along doing not, some people may end up doing more, some people may end up doing less. Yeah. Um, thank you for noticing that as well. Um, so, so the fifth piece of advice is to arrange regular meetings that is at a time that suits everyone's commitments. This means that you can do work before each meeting, discuss at the meeting, and what to pl- what to do next regularly. Re- regular meetings. We talked about this a bit earlier in relation to a question we got from Zoe. Um, yes, really important, and make it so that people are comfortable actually attending those meetings as well. Um, yeah, that's you know it's common sense almost, isn't it? Um, and also keep in mind that some people love working at nine o'clock in the morning, or the people love working at eight o'clock at night. Try and find a bit of a balance in that, uh, and don't railroad people by insisting on a specific time. I agree as well. I think that all those pieces of advice are solid. So thank you to all the students who contributed those advice. They're really good. Uh, if you want to give advice uh, in the future or answer any of our questions, then we ask them either at our workshops or on social media, uh, which you can follow us on at Derby Uni Library on Twitter and Instagram.